My name is uh, Nasser Duhaby. I recently uh, graduated with my PhD from Stanford in uh, mechanical engineering, data-driven design. Um, I also co-founded my uh, travel startup a couple years ago uh, that generates uh, personalized uh, travel recommendations using an, an AI um, approach. Uh, my responsibility was to bring this technical expertise and develop the recommendation engine feature. I'm happy to talk more uh, about that. For this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on um, the work that I did during my PhD. And this presentation is actually a condensed version of the defense that I gave uh, a couple months back. And so without further ado, we can, we can get started. So the title of the work is called Investigating Customer Perceptions of Sustainable Features to Drive Demand for Sustainable Products. And so to give you a bit of background about my work, a study found that 73% of millennials are willing to pay more for sustainability. And uh, this is great, except that it does not actually translate to real purchasing decisions. And so this presents a challenge and an opportunity for designers to create a solution that can address this. And when conducting literature review in this space, I found that the majority of sustainable products are created based on engineered sustainability criteria. For example, using a tool like a life cycle analysis. So let's say a designer wants to select a type of material for their product. Uh, so they might select that material so that it reduces the energy required during the manufacturing phase of the product. Or maybe they'll select the material so that it reduces the environmental impact during the disposal phase. For example, if it's a recyclable material. And these are all very important uh, sustainability requirements for a product, but it neglects perceived sustainability, which is how customers perceive sustainability in a product and think about sustainability. And so these perceptions are based on available information, thoughts, and prior experiences. And so in order for a sustainable product to be truly successful, it needs to account both for engineered sustainability requirements but also perceived sustainability requirements. And we see that this is not actually a, a new concept in design and designers have already been doing this, but in other product domains. And so I'd like to give you an example over here. So we have uh, images of two cars. And if I was to ask you which car is a sports car and which car is an off-road car, you'd likely be able to, to quickly tell which one is which with very limited information. But you know, some of you may be very familiar with these cars and you already know what they're capable of. So let's take this a step further and now look just at the interiors. Again, just based on these images without knowing any technical information about the cars in terms of the horsepower, the suspension and so on, you could likely tell that the image on the left belongs to a sports car and the image on the right belongs to an off-road car. And then if we just take this even further and focus on one specific feature, the wheel or the rim, Again, you can probably be able to make a decision on which wheel belongs to which car. And so the point that I make here is that perceptions are real and the designers are already taking them into account in other product domains. And so in my research, my goal was to be able to bring this into uh, sustainable products so that we can create uh, sustainable products that also resonate with the users and can uh, drive their success. In, uh, in markets. And so this leads me to the research question of my work, which is how can designers identify perceived sustainable design features to create sustainable products that align with customer needs? Now, customer needs um, is a foundational uh, step in the design thinking process that drives a lot of um, design decisions. And traditional approaches for understanding customer needs is using uh, approaches like surveys, interviews, focus groups, and observations. But these approaches do have their limitations. Uh, they're open to uh, biases. For example, in a survey, based on how you phrase a question, you might get different responses. And then these approaches are also challenging to scale due to um, time and cost constraints. And so with uh, recent developments in e-commerce and social media, 
there's been a huge growth in online data that's available and has opened the doors for alternate approaches to understand customer needs that involve machine learning, data mining, and natural language processing. And these approaches can um, address some of the challenges with the traditional approaches, because first of all, the data is already available online. So you're not, you're not asking it from people and this reduces potential for biases. And then second of all, since there's a huge amount of data that's available, uh, you can also scale these approaches to gather um, insights from, from a, a much larger um, data source. And so for, for my work, I focused on these alternate approaches in order to identify these customer perceptions. So I'd like to give you an example of how this works. So here we have two reviews for a water pitcher. Uh, the top review is a positive review. And if we highlight certain uh, phrases, we can get an idea of what these perceptions are. So in the top review, for example, the reviewer says they innovate the packaging and design of their products to be better for the environment and function better. So here the packaging and design uh, resonate with the user as sustainable. Now, if you look at the bottom review, uh, this is a, an example of a negative review. And again, if we look at uh, certain phrases here, here the reviewer says, we're calling it quits and getting rid of it. The filters are faulty, barely ever letting water through. And so here the reviewer is complaining about the filters and they wanna uh, just throw away the, the whole product. And so in my work, I follow a similar approach, but uh, using uh, machine learning and natural language processing to scale this approach to thousands of reviews. And so this leads me to the three main studies that I conducted during this work. The first is extracting perceived sustainable design features from online reviews. The second is to then validate that these features actually resonate with users as being sustainable. And then the third step is investigating how these features can drive purchasing decisions of sustainable products. Now for this presentation, I'm going to focus on the first and third study um, because the second study is more of a, um, you know, academically rigorous approach that you likely would not do in industry. Uh, but for, for my PhD, we have to uh, be very thorough in terms of validating what the findings are. So uh, I'll just be focusing mainly on the first and third study and give you a very brief summary for the second study. And so I'll go ahead and start with the uh, first study here. And so going into this first study, uh, the proposition that I had was that product reviews related to sustainability contain semantic and sy syntactic characteristics that can be modeled. In order to test this proposition, I developed an approach that combines research from three uh, fields. First is identifying customer perceptions, which originates from uh, marketing and psychology research. The second is reading design ideas, which is a common uh, approach used in design research. And then thirdly, natural language processing, which uh, we, I took from uh, computer science. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the first approach introduced into the design space that combines these three uh, research areas in, in order to identify uh, customer perceptions. And so this is an overview of what the uh, the method looks like. So first of all, um, I collect product reviews from Amazon. The second step is to then annotate these reviews via crowdsourcing. And so asking participants to annotate parts of reviews that stand out to them as being sustainable. Third is to then model the reviews and annotations using natural language processing. And fourthly, to identify these perceived sustainable product features from the models. And so I'll go into uh, detail for each step now. So as a case study for my work, I used uh, French presses and uh, collected 1,474 reviews for these four French presses that are shown here. Um, I picked French presses because they're a ubiquitous product and they're also uh, likely to have concerns related to sustainability. And so I selected these products because they have similar features and they also have similar price points. And as we probably all know, um, fake reviews is a common uh, issue that Amazon faces. And so to try to circumvent that, I used an online tool called FakeSpot that estimates authenticity of reviews based on author's history and other factors. And so I selected products that have at least an 80% authentic minimum review uh, score. 
Then uh, with that, I moved on to the second step, which is annotating the reviews via crowdsourcing. And so to annotate these reviews, I recruited 900 respondents from Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk is a uh, crowdsourcing platform that you can hire workers to complete tasks. Um, it's commonly used in, in data science for uh, labeling data. And then with those respondents, I asked them to annotate reviews on a Qualtrics survey. And so there was three versions of the survey to account for the three sustainability aspects, social, environmental, and economic. And I split the 900 annotators equally across those three. And just to give you a bit more detail about these um, sustainability aspects. So these are the, the kind of guidelines and definitions that I use in this study. And ultimately a product needs to account for all of these three aspects in order to be truly sustainable. It needs to be socially sustainable in terms of the health and safety and other factors. It needs to be environmentally sustainable in terms of its impact on, on the planet. And it also needs to be economically sustainable in terms of you know, um, being not too expensive, uh, but also uh, being able to sell at a price that's profitable for the designer and the seller. So all of these aspects have to be considered and um, I evaluate each of them individually uh, for this work. And so I'd like to give you an example of how this annotation process looks like. So this is an example from the social sustainability version of the survey. Um, and so uh, the, the annotator is presented with a review that's pulled randomly from a um, cloud storage, and then they can drag and drop their mouse to highlight parts of the review that they uh, identify as being relevant to sustainability. And they can, multi they can um, annotate multiple reviews. And then on the next page, they're asked uh, follow-up questions about those specific phrases that they had just highlighted. And so um, I asked them to type in the specific product feature that's mentioned in that phrase, and also to rate the positive and negative uh, emotions for that phrase as well. And uh, then on the next page, it asks the same questions, but now for the second phrase that they highlighted. And uh, the reason why I asked for this information is essentially to provide more data to the machine learning model so that they can better pick up on what these features are that are perceived as sustainable. And so that leads me to the third step, which is to then model the reviews and annotations uh, using natural language processing. And so I'd like to just summarize the data that I've collected uh, at this point. So the first uh, set of data are the highlighted phrases that are relevant to a sustainability aspect. Um, and to process this, I used a, a bag of words approach. Um, I won't go into the definitions of them because I, I believe most of the audience here um, comes from a data science background and they're familiar with it. Um, so uh, the second type of data point here is the product feature that's mentioned in the phrases. And um, to process that, I used a uh, topic modeling approach called latent Dirichlet allocation, uh, also uh, known as LDA. And then for the third step, uh, for the positive and negative energy in the phrase, I took a net emotional score um, and essentially subtracted the negative energy from the positive energy to come up with a net uh, emotional energy score. And so in order to model this data, I used a log logistic classification model because it's a simple, yet highly robust approach that can, can work for um, many different types of data. And it's also um, interpretable in terms of uh, the types of uh, uh, significant parameters that it identifies. And so we can see this uh, model over here. Uh, we have an input X that, that, that's then modeled uh, with uh, some uh, beta parameters and then an output Y is predicted. And uh, the beta parameters are estimated with maximum uh, likelihood that's shown here in the second equation. And so in terms of the data that I've collected, the input X data uh, consists of two things. They're the bag of words from the highlighted phrases and then also the hot encoded feature topics generated from the LDA. And then in terms of the output Y, it's the net emotional energy score and I binarized this so that um, one is for positive and zero is for neutral or negative. And then the beta parameters are fitted uh, that are optimized with a um, maximum likelihood. And these beta parameters are, are very important for my work because they, tell, they will tell me essentially what are the most um, critical 
uh, features perceived as sustainable that are driving positive or negative sentiment um, in the models. And that leads me to the fourth and final step, which is then identify these perceived sustainable product features based on those uh, beta parameters. And so before uh, presenting the results, I want to uh, talk about the pre-evaluation. So one of the things that I did was to evaluate the annotator behavior. So each annotator was shown 15 reviews to annotate. And this chart here shows us out of those 15 reviews, how many of them did participants indicate had something relevant to sustainability. And so here we see the number of relevant reviews on the x-axis and then the number of participants on the y-axis. And we see this for the three uh, sustainability aspects, social, environmental, and economic. And for the most part, we see that there is a normal distribution over here. However, we do see sort of a um, surge in the number of, of participants here at the end. And so there's a subset of participants that were annotating every review as relevant to sustainability, which is unlikely uh, to be the case. And so they were likely um, doing more than they needed to. And this could introduce some noise in the data. But for the most part, um, you know, we see a normal distribution here that, that tells us that we can have confidence in the, the way that the annotators evaluated the, the reviews. And uh, second of all, uh, looking into the model evaluation. So here I use metrics from computer science precision recall in F1 to evaluate the models for um, each of the sustainability aspects and for each of the labels, positive and negative. And we can see here that across the board, the precision was uh, quite high at above um, 80%. Um, the recall was a little bit lower at about 70% for social environmental, but it does a dip here for the economic aspects. And the reason for this is uh, there was uh, more of an imbalance in the data in economic aspects where there was a lot more positive um, annotations than negative. And so we're likely to see more noise associated with the model aspects of the economic aspects data. But again, for the most part, this tells us that we can be fairly confident with um, the model outputs that we get. And so now I'd like to talk about the results. So this chart here is specific for the social aspects um, results. On the y-axis, we have the beta parameters from the model. And on the x-axis, we have the, um, the features that correspond to these beta parameters. And if we look on the right half side, we see the top 20 positive features. So these are the features that had the largest, uh, largest positive beta parameters in the model. And then on the left side, we see the top 20 negative features. So these are the, the features that have the largest uh, negative uh, beta parameters in the model. And by focusing on certain phrases, we can get an idea of what these perceptions are. So on the uh, positive side, a lot of these features are intangible. They relate to things like gift or taking to work or for my um, significant other or easy to use. Um, and then on the negative side, they become more tangible relating to safety issues like sharp crease, suddenly breaking, feeling flimsy, and so on. Now, moving on to the environmental aspects uh, results, if we look on the positive side, we see that a lot of these features are now more tangible relating to good durability, such as well-made, very durable, stainless steel, no plastic. And then on the left side, again, a lot of these relate to uh, poor durability, such as already breaking, glass broke, too thin, or the plastic. Finally, looking at the economic aspects results. So, a lot of these were mostly generic and likely due to the additional noise that uh, we had identified earlier. But essentially on the positive side, um, the features relate to things like the product being you know, a good value for money, such as worth money, great value, worth the price. Or on the uh, left side here, they relate to the product being not a good value, you know, feeling cheaper, glass is fragile, lightweight, cheap, poor design, and so on. Um, and so th these are the feature topics that were generated from the LDA. So essentially, these are the summarized topics that were identified from the um, free form text that was typed in by participants. And a lot of these features we had identified in the model, for example, easy to use um, or liking the product. But an interesting feature here that was not identified in the model is energy and water consumption, part of the environmental uh, aspects. 
survey. And this is interesting because you would think that energy and water consumption uh, would be uh, an important uh, part that contributes to environmental sustainability, but participants did not pick up on that. And so to, to study this a little bit further, I conducted a life cycle analysis for an average French press and found that the manufacturing phase had one of the lowest impacts on the environment, but this is where most of the perceptions focused on relating to uh, features about material. But in reality, the most significant impacts on the environment are the transportation and the use phase. And here's where energy and water consumption falls under. And so this really highlights the, the gap between perceived sustainability and engineered sustainability and why it's really important to design for both when creating a sustainable product. And so to conclude this first study, uh, customer perceptions of sustainable features can be extracted from online reviews. And I demonstrated the proposed method using reviews of French presses. And um, designers can use the proposed method to design not only for engineered sustainability, but also perceived sustainability. And so uh, this led me to the second study, which, as I mentioned, I'm going to give a very highly condensed uh, version of. And uh, essentially, what I wanted to do in the study is to validate those features that I extracted um, as being that they actually resonate with, with participants as, as sustainable. And to do that, I used a collage activity. And I'll give you a demo of how this collage activity works. So the collage consists of two axes uh, that range from sustainable on the y-axis and like on the x-axis. Uh, this is an example from the environmental aspects version. So similar to the annotation process, I also split this collage activity into three versions. Um, and so on the left, the participants can view their criteria. On the right, the products are available and each product has an Amazon icon. And then they can click on that and it opens up a live pop-up of the Amazon page so they can read about the product, uh, get familiarized with it. And then they can drag and drop the product onto the collage to evaluate it. And then also select features from a um, drop-down menu based on what stands out to them about that product. And so based on this collage activity and the, um, and the way that the participants placed the products and the features that they selected, I was able to validate that customers resonated more with the features that I had identified in the first study and uh, that they resonated with them as being sustainable. Um, and so that's sort of a very high level summary of this uh, study. And I also wanted to uh, add a note on generalizability of the findings. So, so far, you know, my work has focused on uh, features of a French press, but I wanted to test how could it generalize for other products. And so I tested this approach on different products, including electric scooters and baby glass bottles. Um, again, these are, you know, like typical household products that you might find. And I found that the findings held true for electric scooters from both experiments. So I got back the same uh, results as I did with the French bus. However, with the baby glass bottle, uh, the machine learning model performed poorly because the reviews were overly positive. And so this, um, this demonstrates a limitation with this method that the, the products really need to have a sort of a balanced uh, review, uh, balanced review ratings. And so for products like a baby glass bottle, it's likely that they are overly positive on Amazon. Otherwise, they wouldn't survive on it because you know, no parent wants to buy a 4.1 star baby glass bottle. It has to be like a 4.7, 4.8. Um, and so that was an that was an interesting, you know, an important limitation that I found. And so products should carefully be selected to ensure a balanced data set for this approach to work. Uh, and so with that, I'll move on to the final study here, which is investigating purchasing decisions of sustainable products. So for this study, I had two propositions. First is that online customers rely on product descriptions to learn about products. And based on this, we propose that designers can modify product descriptions that customers resonate more with sustainable products. And second, online customers rely on product descriptions to guide their purchasing decisions. And based on this, we propose that designers can modify descriptions to drive purchasing decisions for sustainable products. In order to test these propositions, I created an Amazon shopping simulation 
um, where I can control all the product images, all the descriptions, the titles that are shown to uh, participants. And I'll give you a demo of, of how uh, this works over here. So we have some options that the user can browse from. They can click on it. They can look at the images in detail. They can look at different uh, angles of the image. They can uh, read the description. And then they can go back and select a different product to uh, read about, look at similar information, and then ultimately decide to, to buy this product and um, uh, place an order. Uh, but you know, as I mentioned, this is a simulation. So there's no, no real transaction that's happening. We don't request for any credit card information. Um, it's just simply a simulation to try to emulate what a purchasing decision um, might be. And so to and with so with that shopping simulation, I had three hypotheses that I wanted to test. The first is that participants are more likely to select to purchase a product when the description is combined with features perceived as sustainable versus dummy features. Second is that participants will rate their products on Amazon as more desirable when the product description is combined with features perceived as sustainable versus dummy features. And third, that participants will rate a product on Amazon as more sustainable when the product description is combined with features perceived as sustainable versus dummy features. And so in order to test these hypotheses, I created a within subject experiment design and recruited 200 participants from Amazon Mechanical Turk. And so each participant went through a control condition and a test condition. In the control condition, the participants were exposed to four products. So two of these were base products and the other two were products that have these extra dummy features. And then in the test condition, they were exposed to the same two products, but then the other two products are products that have these perceived sustainable features that are derived from what I extracted in the first study. And so ideally what I'm hoping to see here is that a larger portion of participants are gonna purchase products from this section over here in the test condition versus the percentage of participants that purchase products from this section here in the control condition in order to um, test our hypotheses. So in order to make this a realistic shopping experience, I needed to come up with a variety of different features uh, so that participants have something to, to browse between. And so to do that, I came up with three types of features and I'll talk about each type now. So the first type is the base feature. And these are features that are gonna be present in every single product across both conditions. Um, and so there's three types of base features. There's the handle shape, the spout, and the lid. So these are you know, basic functional aspects of a French press. And there's different options between, for each feature, again, to just provide variety. For example, circular handle versus rectangular handle. The second type of feature is the uh, these extra dummy features. And uh, these consist of an hourglass timer and a ventilated lid. So these features, I was very sensitive with how I selected them because essentially they are the competitors for the perceived sustainable features. And so I wanted to select uh, dummy features that would be highly desirable to, to, really, um, to really be able to challenge and test the, the hypothesis in a, in a rigorous way. And then finally, we have the sustainable features. And so these are features that are derived from the features that I extracted from the first study. And so they include things like stainless steel versus plastic or strong glass, easy to clean, high quality and perfect gift. And I'd just like to point out here that certain features are descriptive. So they would only be shown in the description um, and so here, you know, it's e in this case, it's either part of this, the description or it's not part of the description. Uh, but other features are both visual and descriptive. And so I made sure that in the, in the Amazon simulation that this was accounted for. So if a, if a description said that there's an hourglass timer, that the image also agrees with that and showed an hourglass timer. And so based on these features, I came up with 12 uh, product designs. Uh, that I created with a CAD software. And uh, over here, the first two products are the base products. Um, so these are the, the products that are consistent in both the control and test conditions. And then the second two products are the products that have these extra dummy features. 
And then the next eight products are products with perceived sustainable features. And so in the control condition, participants were shown these four products here at the top. And then for the test condition, they were shown these two base products in addition to a random choice of two products from here. And so um, just to give you an example of how this all looks like when we put it together, we have the product image here. Participants can um, select between the different products. On the right side, we have the description. And I was very careful with how I phrased and how I wrote these descriptions. So they all follow the same format, every product page. They have these um, bullet points here that are very brief and to the point to make sure that participants read them. And each bullet point starts off with the feature right away. So stainless steel carafe, press of a button, which we can see here, uh, filtered spout, circular grip handle, and then all of them mention one liter capacity. And then I also uh, named the titles of the products with these features. And this is something that I've commonly seen on Amazon. And again, it's just an additional measure to make sure that participants are reading these features and that they um, see them. And then, you know, the other part of the, the product page are these reviews. And, and these reviews, I needed to make sure that they're consistent between every product page because I don't want them to influence the decision. You know, I want to isolate the decision based on the difference in features. So I was, in order to make this consistent, I came up with um, three five-star reviews and two three-star reviews for each product. And they were all very kind of generic, very brief, very simple, and, um, and consistent between each product page. And just to kind of add on to this, you know, it was very important that I control for different variables that could influence purchasing decisions. For example, the aesthetics of an image, how nice an image looked like might drive the decision and not the actual features. Similarly, the readability of descriptions, the positivity of the reviews and the price. And so I made sure to control for all of these, um, all of these variables. Um, for these first three over here, I conducted several pilot studies where I asked participants to rate images, ratings, and reviews, um, and um, selected, you know, finalized the selection after I saw that the, the ratings were consistent across the board to make sure that these aren't influencing the decisions. And then for the price, I ranged it across a $2 range randomly between all the different products. Um, again, because I don't want price to, to, be, to play a role here. I'm just really trying to isolate um, the impact of the features on the decision. And then one other important aspect is incentive alignment. So I really wanted participants to be incentivized to select a product that they would actually want. And so to do that, as part of their compensation for this activity, I entered them into a lottery for a product of similar or less value to the one they selected for purchase. And so, you know, the goal here was to really be able to emulate their decision as a, as a real purchasing decision. So with that, I can now uh, go over the results. So first of all, in terms of the participants, out of the 200 that I recruited, I approved responses from 162. Uh, this is based on things like time to complete the activity, and some other factors to make sure that um, I maintain high quality uh, responses during the analysis. And then here we see the demographics of these participants. So they're mostly young, white, um, leaning towards male, fairly educated, they work a full time, and they're making about an uh, average US income. And these, uh, these demographics are um, in line with, with demographic studies of Amazon mechanical Turk workers. So, they are uh, what we what we would expect. They're not necessarily representative of the U.S., uh, but they are closer to what a typical online user might look like, um, and so closer to what maybe an average Amazon customer in the U.S. might be. And so now I'll go over the um, hypothesis results. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the first hypothesis, and here. I was looking at if participants are more likely to select to purchase a product when the description is combined with features perceived as sustainable versus dummy features. So on the left here, uh, we can see a graph that shows the fraction of purchases for both the control and test conditions. In the test condition, it focuses on sustainable feature products and in the control condition on the dummy feature products. And we can see that there was a larger fraction of purchases in the test condition which supports the hypothesis. And when I conducted a t-test, 
I found that this difference is statistically significant. And so the results here uh, validate the hypothesis that these perceived sustainability features can drive uh, purchasing decisions. The second hypothesis is that um, participants are willing to rate a product on Amazon as more desirable when these descriptions are combined with features perceived as sustainable. And so as a proxy to measure desirability, I asked participants to rate their willingness to pay of each of the products on a five point uh, Likert scale. And so here on the left side, we can see a graph showing the mean change in willingness to pay over the base products in both the dummy features um, and the sustainable features. And we can see that there's a greater mean change here in the test condition, which again supports our hypothesis. And when doing a t-test, we see that the difference is statistically significant. Um, and so our, our results uh, support this hypothesis. Um, and it also supports the initial uh, study that I talked about where 73% of millennials are willing to pay more for sustainability. And so it really highlights that, you know, the, the, the desire is there, but the products are just not resonating with the users as sustainable. And that's why it's really important to include these features, these perceived features. Lastly, the third uh, hypothesis is that participants will rate a product on Amazon as more sustainable when the product description is combined with features perceived as sustainable versus dummy features. And so to test this, I asked participants to rate each of the products in terms of how sustainable it is, also on a five point likelihood scale. And so on the graph here, we see the mean change in sustainability rating over the base products. And we see these for both the control condition and the test condition. And we see that there's a much greater change in the desk, test condition, uh, which supports the hypothesis. And again, when doing a t-test, it's, it's strongly significant. And this is really interesting because in reality, none of the features that um, I included can contribute to real engineer sustainability. But these features here that we extracted from the Amazon reviews resonate with people as being sustainable. And so they, they rated these products as, as more sustainable. Um, and so, yeah, they, these results validate the third hypothesis. So to conclude this study, uh, designers should use perceived sustainable design features in addition to engineer sustainability criteria to align sustainable products with customer needs. And uh, perceived sustainability features can help designers drive purchasing decisions for sustainable products. And in terms of next steps, you know, as I mentioned, this was a very kind of controlled simulated environment. So it would be great to be able to test this on real products with real purchasing decisions. And then also to look into how it generalizes for different product domains. And so just to kind of summarize the overall contribution of my work, um, I developed a method for designers to extract features perceived as sustainable from online reviews. I identified a gap between perceived and engineered sustainability features. I validated that the features perceived as sustainable resonate more with users than features not perceived as sustainable. And lastly, I demonstrated that customers are more likely to purchase products with perceived sustainable features than with dummy features. And uh, last but not least, you know, I won't go through all the names here, but I just want to highlight that this was a very, um, very much a team effort. I, I said the word I a lot, but in reality, there's a, a large team behind me that made all of this work uh, possible. And um, with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Um, please feel free to also get in touch um, after this talk. My website, um, you can contact me through my website or, or directly on LinkedIn. And you can pretty much find me anywhere, you know, just my, the first letter of my first name, the first letter here, and then my last name, MD Habe. Um, yeah, thank you all for, for listening. So great, thank you. There are Q&As. Uh, can you check those questions, Monsieur? Uh, yeah. Okay. What did you use to automatically collect the 1,474 Amazon reviews? So there are um, paid uh, software tools available, but I actually, um, but I actually made my own sort of uh, script to to scrape them since it, it was a, it, you know I wasn't scraping you know hundreds of thousands of reviews. It was a, it was a small scale, so I just came up with my own script um, to to come up with that.
Um, let me know, by the way, if, if, if you'd like me to add more details on that. Um, what did it cost to have the 900 people on Mechanical Turk annotate their reviews? Yeah, so um, we paid about um, $5 per participant and um, the task on average took about 20, 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes. So all in all, it, it was about um, $6,000 when you include um, at the Amazon Mechanical Turk fees and, and additional um, uh, fees that they add to it as well. All right. Uh, so Alex Zakharov asks, are you aware about TRIZ, T-R-I-Z, theory of inventive problem solving in Russian? Is the set of approaches to system studies, to methods of revealing problems in systems, and to tools for solving these problems with the goal of improvement systems of any nature, from materials to ideal ones, from technological to natural ones, on the base and by the help of universal objective and natural trends loss of evolution. Uh, I have not, I have not heard of that, but that that sounds um, very interesting and um, also sounds familiar, familiar, similar to um, just the design thinking process at Stanford. They always talk about how it's a, it's a it's a problem solving approach that you can use for pretty much any any problem like it, it's been used to solve issues with with airplane um, scheduling and and all kinds of things so it would be interesting to see how those kind of compare or differ and how, how their different applications are um, okay the next person mentions there seems to be a trend toward more disposable um, electronics at the same time that companies are claiming their products are sustainable. How is a consumer supposed to know if a cell phone made with recycled aluminum is really sustainable, even though it was shipped halfway around the world? Yeah, uh, great, great question. And this is sort of the, the issue that we have here, that uh, precisely what you've asked, customers are growing skeptical. So, you know, about 10 years ago, um, this term green marketing came about, and there was a lot of um these you know advertisements that, that said that our product is sustainable and with time people you know people started to realize that that there are a lot of you know misleading messages that are being communicated and um and it made people a lot more skeptical about these claims that people are making and that's that's sort of what has led probably a, a reason that has led to this gap between what real engineer sustainability is and what perceptions of sustainability are. Um, and that's why it's really important to, to ask the person, the, ask users directly, um, what to them means a product is sustainable and make sure that your product is accounting for that in addition to meeting engineered sustainability requirements. And the hope is that with time, we can start to bridge this uh, gap together. But I think this green marketing approach uh, definitely has led to a lot of skepticism, and that's that's part of the, the challenge here. Um, all right. So you, next question. You mentioned that the transportation and use of a product had more environmental impact than the manufacturing of the product. What category of products do you think this would be true for? How did you do these calculations? Yeah, I think um, this this could be a, applied to. Um, a lot of similar household good products that you know would be made out of um, uh, mostly plastic components, um, and especially the ones that are are made you know in China and are shipped here. You know, of course, products that are made in China and used in China, their transportation are going to be uh, impacts are going to be much lower. Um, and so, yeah, it, it depends on where in the world, how far away is it from the manufacturing place. Um, and so to do these calculations, I basically uh, looked up a, you know, a standard Amazon French press and uh, looked up where it's, um, where it's manufactured. Uh, I forgot the name of the city in China, but it's a pretty big manufacturing city where a lot of, a lot of um, products that are shipped out to the US are, are made. And so just calculated the difference uh, from here, from there to, um, uh, an Amazon warehouse that would be uh, here nearby in the Bay Area, um, and so this would, you know, be through um, through uh, flight shipping, and then 
um, a truck would transport it to a more local warehouse and then eventually to the store. And so that's, that's how I uh, calculated these uh, transportation impacts. Okay, so Alex Zakharov, in TRIZ, there is an approach which is named main parameters of value, which influence on customer solution for purchase. These parameters can't be revealed by traditional methods of analysis, by MPV only. These parameters, sometimes these parameters are unknown even for designer, help to find the real directions to develop next generation product. Okay, very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, if, if you have a paper or a website that you can share, I'd love to, uh, to learn more about that. Caroline Obata, what was the tool used to detect fake reviews? It's called Fake Spot. And uh, you can even add it as a, as a, um, uh, what do you call it? As an add-on, like on your browser. Um, and so I use that even when I'm shopping for my own personal uh, products. Uh, it's, it's very useful. Did you use a Python script to Amazon the to scrape the Amazon reviews? What library did you use? I I did. Um, I did use it. I wrote the script like four or five years ago, so I actually can't remember the exact uh, library, but I can uh, I can go ahead and actually just pull it up for you right now. So, um, okay, and by the way, there's a lot of tutorials as well um, on uh, on Google on like how to just uh, come up with a with a simple uh, with a simple code to, to do this. So. It's a great, Nasir, that, that was a great presentation. There are a lot of stories comes to my mind behind it, and I would like to discuss with you about it later, yeah. maybe yeah. more in person. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, please tune in for our future events. Um, take care. Have a nice day. So Thanks. Just, just to answer that, the last person's question, oh. um, I so I didn't use any, any uh, specific library, um, basically just um, processed the data in JSON files. Um, I used uh, LXML and HTML import requests. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about it, yeah, just feel free to, to, to message me. Um, I can, I can uh, put my direct email here as well and just yeah, feel free to, to contact me for, for anything else. Sure. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Have a good day. Bye. You too. Bye.